Hey everyone, Joshua Hanlon here, and today I'm in Evansville, Indiana with Dan Siskin from Brickmania, and we are going to take a look at the USS Missouri battleship here. Now, longtime viewers of Beyond the Brick will remember that we covered this way back when Dan was first starting work on this. This is a 25 and a half foot model of the USS Missouri. It's, it's built in 135th scale, uh, a common scale I, I build in. I do a lot of military modeling. It's three months into the project. And then I've given some updates over the years, so we wanted to give kind of a final update here because I think it's about as finished as it's ever going to get, right, Dan? Right, right. It's, it's, it's probably had higher states of being finished, but every time we travel, some parts fall off. and it needs a little bit of repairs, and this is sort of the state that it's, it's probably going to be in for the rest of the duration, unless we can get it permanently installed somewhere and I don't have to keep repairing it. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, then, if you want to take us through the ship here and kind of how it's set up right now. Sure. Well, right now, I mean, you on this side of it, everybody, you'll notice everybody's in their dress white uniforms. So it's it's set up exactly how the ship was in uh, September 2nd, uh, 1945, when the Japanese uh, government representatives came aboard and signed the, basically the instrument of surrender uh, in Tokyo Bay, um, at, you know, ending World War II. So that, this is the way the ship was, and they all had, if you look at pictures, they were all, the, all the sailors were wearing, they, they called them undressed white uniforms. Um, and then they had all the brass, so you have all, the, all these officers down here. Um, they are like basically representatives of all the Allied powers. You, know, you have all the, gen, the admirals and generals involved. So MacArthur was there, Nimitz, Halsey, um, basically everybody who had a hand in the defeat of the Japanese Empire uh, was aboard the ship that day. Mm-hmm. So. Fantastic. So that's a ton of minifigs then. So what, what else do we have in the ship here? Sure. Well, you, you will see this actually turned around. If this, typically this is set up on the other side. You'll see the guys in the dress blues, or that the, 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 the blue dungarees. This is like an actual work uniform with their like life jackets on. This is how the other side of the ship would be you know, on display. So the other side, you'll see how it was when they were in a combat situation. So we have all these guys. Brick Arms actually made us some special shells for... Um, you know, that we can put in our anti-aircraft guns, uh, which actually are now just coming out to be available to the public. So it's kind of neat that some of the things that we have on the ship are actually prototypes or things that are products that have, that have turned into reality because of it. So. And you've got some lighting in here as well. Where all does that run through? Right, right. We did, uh, thanks, to, thanks to Rob from Brick Stuff, he, he set us up with a bunch of lights to, to really make the ship pop. We've had a couple of short circuit issues. So you see some of the wires outside, usually that's tucked in inside of everything. I will actually, next time this is in our shop, I will rewire the whole, the, the whole ship just uh, because it, you know, <laughs> it looks a little schleppy with all the wires showing. But um, typically that's not the way it is, but it's uh, all the running lights. You have the search lights lit up, um, running lights. I want to do more, uh, but like I said, it's just always a matter of uh, uh, having enough time to do it when, when it's the few times it is in the shop because this is a big undertaking just setting this up to work on it in our shop is takes about 45 minutes um <laughs> you know unpacking it from its boxes setting it up i mean we can travel around with it and get it set up with a crew of people but um it, it's it's a lot of work <laughs> yeah, i imagine it's a very large build and one piece that you see a ton of on here are tiles and i think with uh, in this current iteration you've tiled like the entire deck now yeah there's not a spot on here and there's a few places here and there where you'll see stud showing and that's because it's not finished so like the backs of the turrets you'll still see the stud showings but that's not really you know people don't really notice mm -hmm. it because it's, it just blends in so well but. So was it difficult to source that many gray tiles for a build of this size? I mean, I know Brickmania is a big company. You've got a lot of builds you're doing, but still, that's a lot of pieces. Yeah, there's a, probably 150,000 tiles on the ship, or maybe more, maybe like 200,000 tiles, just tiles. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot of going to, to pick a brick. It's a lot of uh, 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 brick link orders, and and uh, yeah, it's it's just it, it hasn't. It's not something that just happened overnight. There was <laughs> there was like a year and a half of planning that went into this before I even started putting the bricks together. So, and believe it or not, we're actually getting ready to do our next big mega build too. So, wow. <laughs> so you heard it here first. <laughs> there you go. Brick Mini will have another massive ship touring around. <laughs> it will be. It'll be as exact, just as big as this one. So. Okay. We'll look forward to that. So then you've got, down here is an example of one of the, the kind of bigger turrets on yeah. the ship. So talk about kind of the design of this and how that fits in. Well, the, the, obviously the turrets on one of these ships are just massive. This is like the size of a house. Um, and it's built, I, I'll pull the top off. You can see how it's built inside. Um, I never, I had, I had high, high hopes that I would actually one day be able to motorize all these guns, and um, I probably still can if I, if I come up with the time. But you can see that it's hollow in there, and these guns would actually be able to depress into the turrets just like a real ship. Um, someday I'll get around to doing it, mm -hmm. um, and it is built to travel. So we, we take these turrets off, and it just comes off. There's gravity holding it on, just like the real ship. Um, let's see if I can get it back on in one piece. 
That's always a trick. <laughs> yeah. It takes a special skill to get the yeah, turret back on. But then the guns just pop right off. So it's, it's, it's designed to travel. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, you obviously had travel in mind when you were designing this. Yeah, well, the, every section, I learned the hard way that you cannot build anything wider than a door. So I've actually had, to, I had these giant castles that I used to build. And, and one day I moved and I was like, oh, how do I get it out of the house? So now, um, having learned that's not a good idea to build wider than 30 inches, it's built in sections since 30 inch slices and go through any size, standard size door. Okay, yeah. So that makes a lot of sense then. So do you have any idea how many different shows this has been to over the last several years as you've toured around? You know, it's, it's really hard to judge. <laughs> it's, it's at least 100 different, different wow. locations, yeah. Um, there was a year, I mean, this year, this has only traveled to like maybe five events this year. Uh, in previous years, it's been like 30, you know, the year before 30. So maybe not, maybe not 100, maybe like, but still definitely over 50 mm -hmm. um, for sure. Yeah. So has it traveled outside the U.S. or is taking it kind of overseas or anything ever a possibility in your mind for something this size? It, it, it could go anywhere. It's just a matter of cost, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's been it's been for the four corners of the U.S. I mean, it's for sure, it's been to California, it's been to uh, Florida, New England, Seattle, you know, every and everywhere in between, you know, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Well, that's massively impressive. So then what is the exact, you've mentioned a couple of times how, you know, setup is a really big deal with this. So when you bring this to show, what exactly is that like? What's kind of the process like for that? Well, we have to, you know, I'll just show you how the sections come apart here. So this is, this, you're looking at one section. It just slides apart. Um, and we can pull the, pull the different sections apart. So you can see 30 inches. Um, it's actually built to, to withstand just you being able to pick it up and okay. kind of manhandle it well, except the, the figures. <laughs> but it's it's definitely built for strength. Um, you, you could stand on this without any 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 problem whatsoever. Um, so you have all these sections. It's actually resting on its crates. So below this 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 custom drop that we had made for it, um, there's there's ten packing crates, and those crates become you know it's a stand when we're when we're parked, you know on display. But uh, when we're not on display, it packs up inside the base. Mm -hmm. so. And I'm sure a lot of that support for, comes from the inside structure there. So what's that like with the, the kind of you know columns and things that keep this up? It's a it's a technic. Here I'll, I'll actually pull this turret off again, and you'll be able to see that it's a, it's a it's technic beams um, throughout. Okay. So up top and bottom, you know it's a grid. Basically, it's like two pancakes. The deck is the top one pancake. The bottom is another pancake with bricks built up in between it. Uh, locked together with Technic beams, so it cannot. You can pick it up from the top, and the bottom will not drop out. Mm -hmm. And the whole ship is made that way. You can pick up the, the bigger pieces um, from the top, and the bottom will not fall off. Mm -hmm. So you've done a number of these large-scale builds like this. Then is that something you would recommend to other people if they're looking to build kind of on this scale? Is that type of structure works For really sure. well? I, I, this is my third big mega ship, kind of behind the Nicholas behind us here, being my second. That one has traveled a lot too, but it doesn't travel nearly as well. So a lot of lessons learned on previous builds to went into building this one. Mm -hmm. And then what are the plans for this? So I know we, we talked about how you've had this at a bunch of shows. Is it still planning to be touring in future years, or what's that going to be like? Well, we've kind of decided, you know, me being on the road and even Brick Mania's crew on the road, it, it's really hard on us. And it's mm -hmm. hard, hard on the models. It's hard on our, our, our staff because this is not our primary business. We, you know, we love to display our models, but ultimately we need to be back in our, in our, in our you know, in our toy factory <laughs> building toys for you know, our kits. So... We think what we want to do is, is park this thing permanently, uh, if not, you know, 100% permanent, at least to have a, have a normal home where people can come and see it. Mm -hmm. um, that would be in our warehouse in Minneapolis. We're, we used to have a big, our, our old warehouse, which we still use, is, our, is, is primarily where we construct all of our kits. Um, so now what we want to do is um, get another space because that's completely full. We, are, we have 30 workers back in Minneapolis, and they completely fill our warehouse. So we're going to get another warehouse that we can put this in, be open to the public seven days a week. Mm -hmm. so. That would be fantastic. So people could come by and check it out in all its glory here. And then the next ship. So the, the space that we're looking at has room has room for two of these easily, okay. easily. Um, so it'd be open seven days a week. And you know, people always come by Minneapolis, and they they're kind of like, I, I you know, I want to see your your warehouse, but you're not open to the public. And all we can send them to is our store at the Mall of America, which is tiny, and doesn't have much on display. And and you know, when we have these huge, beautiful models, we'd, we'd like to get the public to see them. Mm -hmm. So, Has there been any talk about taking this to the actual Battleship Missouri for a display ever? <laughs> well, we've been approached by some of the other ships in the class okay. about bringing it to their events. Uh, I think Hawaii might just be a little far, because that's where the real Missouri is. Um, you know, if, if obviously, if somebody's willing to pay for it, we would bring it wherever. Uh, and we, we have brought it to different shows on request. You know, we've, we've done video game conventions. We've done things like that. But... 
Um, typically speaking, uh, uh, non, you know, most of those things are museums or nonprofits, and they don't have a whole lot of money to, to, to throw around for right, displays. Yeah. So. And, and, you know, it's me. You know, we basically, I, Brickmania is a small company. I don't have a, a lot of money to say, hey, I want to show up and, and put this on display. So. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. Well, I'm glad you were able to bring it out here with a bunch of your other builds. Very nice display area here, and it's nice to get it out in public at least once more before it kind of parks itself a bit in that warehouse. Yeah, well, and, and when I say warehouse, it's kind of the misnomer because our where it'll be more of a museum right. setting like this. That we we really appreciate being invited into a, a museum that has lights and um, you know nice facilities. Whereas you know sometimes at Lego conventions, it's 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 not necessarily in the best uh, viewing viewing location. Yes, exactly. Well, I'm glad you could bring it out. Thanks again for setting the whole thing up here and getting the lights on and everything yeah. and taking us through the ship. Appreciate it, Dan. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for uh, speaking with me again. Appreciate it. There you go. That's how you build. Hey everyone, Joshua Hamlin here at Brick Live in Birmingham, England, and I am front uh, in front of the world's largest Lego ship here with Warren and Julie, and they're going to tell us a little bit about kind of the inspiration for this build and how this all went down. So Julie, if you just want to start off, kind of uh, what was the thinking behind this and why did you guys first decide to, to commission this ship? Yeah. Well, DFTS is celebrating their 150th anniversary this year, so we've been in business for a very long time, so we thought we have to do something really big to celebrate this. and. Um, and I had worked for Lego for a little while, so we thought, we could maybe do something. Lego's a Danish company, DFDS is a Danish company. We could, uh, maybe we could build something in Lego. And of course it should be a ship, since we're a shipping company. Um, so we got in touch with Warren, and we started talking with him about building it. And we had a design from our, from our own head of new buildings. So we asked him for a futuristic design, so this ship doesn't exist yet, but maybe it will in the future. Because we wanted to not only celebrate our anniversary, but look towards the future. So, um, so we designed this kind of curvy, funky ship, <laughs> and uh, and Warren worked with our head of uh, new building design and came up with a version in Lego. So, very nice. So then, Warren, yeah, you can tell us a little bit about kind of the design process and where you guys started with this. Yeah, sure. So, um, well, it was one. It, it was an interesting project. It's not one that you get every day. Um, yeah, we got uh, some ideas through from the head of design. Kind of, could you do this with Lego? Could you do that with Lego? And try to work out how to build it. Because we, we kind of started off with doing, we're going to build something really big, but we weren't sure how big or what we were going to do with it. But then DFDS said, well, we want to take it to all of our offices. And we go, okay, so we can go big, but you know we need to be able to move this thing. Um, so we came up with the design, and then we did what we call a big build. So we came up with a design, and we built a prototype for the design. Now, our prototype model was three meters long. So it's a 12-foot long prototype. <laughs> <laughs> and we built the prototype designs of the various pieces and then started scaling them up. So we then asked, we got a million bricks sent out to 75 locations, I think? Yeah, all over, all of our ships, everybody in DFDS got a yeah. chance to build some of the bricks. Yeah. We sent out this million bricks all over, all over Northern Europe. Yeah. Um, and they all went out and we, from two by fours, we asked them to build basically quad scale two by fours. So instead of four stars long, they're 16 stars long, and um, and then ship those bricks back to us. So we had for about three weeks, we had all manner of random boxes turning up with e in every method you can imagine. I mean, we had like articulated lorries turning up with one single box of Lego on the back, going, "Yeah, that's from this ship." <laughs> so we had all of these ship these bricks just turning up, um, and then all we had to do was put them together. So all we had to do was to copy our prototype up four times, um, which gets technically quite tricky when you get to something like something this big. Right, right. Um, I mean, it's quite difficult to kind of get a handle on how big it is. Even when you see it, you don't realize how big it is. But if you think like the lettering on the side, the DFDS logo on the side, um, there, those individual letters are around about 70 odd bricks high and about 200 odd studs long. Um, the Maltese Cross logo is about 80 studs wide and 80 bricks high. And you kind of think, well, that won't take long. I'll just do that bit this afternoon and then realize you've spent two days <laughs> building a single logo. Um, and we also, you know, the size and the weight of it, this is, there's 2.8 tons of Lego wow. in this. <laughs> That's intense. <laughs> it's a lot of Lego. And you kind of build a, you know, you build a little bit, put it on top of the model and then realize you can't lift that. You need two people to help you lift that single piece and put it on top. Um, so we had all sorts of challenges building it, which was fine. But we also, because the ship moves, 
You know, this is it. All right, it doesn't float, but it does drive. So because it kind of floats because we we do sail it on board our ships because oh, it's traveling yeah. around to all of our harbor, all of our terminals, and everything. So so it does get to float. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. So you know the they'll there's no kind of tractor unit, which is the bit with the engine at the front at the moment right now. But at the end of the show, one will come in. They'll hook up the tractor unit, drive it off and it'll get towed off to the next location and then the next location after that. And it'll get driven on board ship. So, you know, if you, it goes on ferries and has to go up the ramps and down the ramps and, you know, sway from side to side. Um, and it's, you know, it's a complicated thing to do. And you end up with all sorts of things that we had not really thought about when we started. Well, we kind of, we hoped it wouldn't be a problem and it's not, thankfully. But things like this lorry isn't straight, right? So you'd imagine a big box lorry, right. flat bottom, flat top, they're not. They're very slightly curved, um, which is fine because, you know, who would want to build a massive Lego model that really needs a flat surface on <laughs> inside, right? <laughs> a very niche uh, audience there that needs that type of design. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So when we, did, um, when we did the framework that it sits in, we actually had to put certain points in so we can jack things up and, and down. And also the bow section at the front. Now that bow section is, it's 1.7 meters wide and just over so, uh, five foot-ish. And it's basically a cube. And that whole section sits above where the tractor unit connects in. So when they tow it away, that whole section lifts and the whole bow section will slide in and out of the ship by about five studs. Wow. Just with the flex of the metal that it's sitting on at the bottom. Um, so there's lots of really complicated bits like that we had to kind of work out exactly where to do, what to do with the heat expansion, because we had to put steel inside it to make it secure to travel, but the steel expands at different rates of the leg are expanding, so there's expansion gaps in there and you know areas where you could adjust it and all sorts of things. So we think, we're pretty certain this is the largest Lego model in the world that moves as a single piece. Wow. Right, it's smaller than the X-Wing, just, but the X-Wing comes apart for transport. This does not. So this is the largest, we think, the largest moving Lego model that's ever been built. That's incredible. And I think you worked on this with kind of a team of people. So you can talk about that kind of the teamwork and how all that went down and, and what sections people worked on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no way. Well, if you did this on your own, you'd be at it for years. <laughs> you know? um, we reckon it was around about 900 hours to do the final assembly. Bearing in mind, we already had the big bricks done. Um, and we had a team of six people working in a warehouse. We had to hire a warehouse to actually build this in because it doesn't fit in our studio. <laughs> That's when you know you've got a good build when you have to hire a building just to do it in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so we had to hire a warehouse, drive this in, build a scaffold rig around the side of it so we could get to it. And um, we had some cherry pickers in, some elevated platforms we can get to. Um, and there's a team of six of us working on it and we all, it's kind of split up. So various people did, did different things. Um, Kirsten and Fraser did some of the lettering, and Alice did a lot of the bow, and I did. I got the really bum job of doing all the walls. I was like, yeah, just build this wall. It's only eight foot long and dark blue. Um, and then we, so we built lots of individual pieces. And then we realized something else as well. So we built the bridge, which is on the top. Oh, a guy built the bridge, spent a day and a half building this bridge. And we thought, that's fine. And then went to pick it up and it's like, not only can only a few of us lift it, we actually had to get lifting gear in to get it up there, to haul it up there, um, because everything is just so massive. Um, and we also had the, you, there are some uh, time lapses we did of the build, and you can see people working from the inside and the outside. So there's actually a secret way we can get inside this ship. So we can get on the inside and build a lot of stuff from the inside and, and, and look at any maintenance. And also there's a couple of spares in there. <laughs> it's just, just a few. <laughs> a couple of boxes of spares. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so it, it ships with all the spare parts and the tools and things like that if we need to do it. So we had to plan that as well and gain access to it, which is from the top, which really scares people if they don't know it, because I know where you can walk on this model. <laughs> and lots of people just see us walking over the top of it, but it's strong. It's a pretty strong build. <laughs> It looks like it would be. So you mentioned the steel. Is the steel what's actually keeping it together in there? Or is that just to kind of make sure it doesn't like fall apart? Like, could you take the steel out and it still stay together? Or is that really make it, what's keeping it all together on the inside? If you didn't have to move it, it wouldn't need the steel. Okay. Um, so it does have a steel framework in there. So it doesn't. You know, so 
you can move it safely. But the main thing about this is because we built, because we had 7,000 people building big bricks and we put the big bricks together, this is not glued. Right, so largely, there are little bits of it that we did have to do. The mast right at the top is, is very fine and, and some pieces, but it's largely completely unglued. So real, what, really what the steel is doing is compressing the bricks and stopping them coming apart when we move it. Um, so if it didn't have to move, you could do it without steel, but I wouldn't be standing right next to it if that was the case. <laughs> Understandable, yeah. You want to want this thing falling on you. <laughs> no, it's a long way up there. It really is a long way. We revealed it in August okay. and it has been to the Baltics, it's been to Oslo, it's been to Germany, it's actually on its way back to Germany after it's here. It was in Utrecht at LEGO World last week and we have bookings for it through next May. Wow. So, <laughs> and who knows, it could be even more because people keep calling and requesting, oh, could we see it at European shipping or could we see it at, uh, at our event? Um, and so, but, it's, but right now it's mostly actually the, the various DFDS offices around the world that are, that are yeah. showing it. Yeah. yeah, it is a really easy mock to move. Okay. Honestly, like you know, I've done lots of mocks, and some of them, you know, are really awkward to move and set up. This one's dead easy. You just drive it in and open the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> so, is this the, the biggest build you and your team have ever worked on, or it's it's the largest build in terms of bricks, okay. um, in terms of weight? Uh, we did in 2012. We held the world record for the largest mosaic very briefly. <laughs> I think it was about 1,100 square foot, something like that, um, about 150 square meters. Um, so we got that, but it was beaten after about three months, something like that. Um, but no, this is the largest, most, you know, largest volume project, project. most, the, certainly the project with the most people working on it, with like thousands of people working on it and the logistics around it and stuff was just insane. Um, so yeah, I don't think we'll be doing anything quite this big just yet. <laughs> He says. <laughs> <laughs> so if there are other people or companies, whoever it might be, that are interested in you doing other projects like this, are you open to the, more of that in the future? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anything, we like a challenge. <laughs> and this, you know, this, this, that's how this kind of came about is Julie came up with this mad idea that, you know, she went, I reckon you can do it. And we thought, <laughs> okay, well, that's nice to know. Um, so yeah, we're, we're definitely, definitely up for a challenge if we can. Um, and. We'll see what happens, see what else. I, I had never thought of doing something like this, so I had no idea what anybody else will come up with. But he was so calm and cool <laughs> and never let on. If he thought that it wouldn't be possible, we never, we never got that feeling. <laughs> well, very cool. I appreciate both of you taking the time to talk with me about it. I think it turned out amazing, and it's certainly a major piece here at the show. I think a lot of people have enjoyed seeing it. Thank you. Thank you. This is a raw production of the USS CVN-78 Gerald Ford. This is the latest aircraft carrier of the United States. It took me six months to build, and this is the first time you can see it. The aircraft carrier is 12 feet long by 4 feet large. There is 100 lights. There's three remote elevators, power with Legos only. It works with a remote. So there's four motors on each elevators, connect with gears.
so I can put on different channels move it, up, move it down easily there is 10 sections and I used 40,000 pieces including more than 300 8x16 tall black plates. I used three different colors for contrast. Sides and tower are in light blush gray, planes in dark gray, and platform in black. I tried a new technique to build the boat hull with tiles on the side instead of regular bricks. The result is better than I thought.
everyone, Joshua Hanlon here, and today I'm at the Brickmania headquarters in Minneapolis, and I'm joined by Dan Siskind and his latest ship model here. So if you want to take us through what this build is. Sure, this is the USS O'Hare. This is a gearing class destroyer built during World War II uh, as part of the US Navy's effort. Of course, uh, these gearing class destroyers were designed to take part in, uh, in the Pacific campaign. Um, they're actually bigger than the previous destroyers. They, they added a, an extra 16 feet of length or 14 feet of length just to put extra fuel oil in them so they'd have more range for these big Pacific cruises. Um, this is the USS O'Hare. The reason we chose the O'Hare is because of our, our store location. We wanted something, something that would have a connection to the Chicago area. And what's better than the USS O'Hare? Of course, there's O'Hare Airport. It's not named after the airport. It's named after the same guy. It's uh, Edward Butch O'Hare. He was a uh, Medal of Honor recipient in World War II and uh, was instrumental in, in, in creating the tactics, the air tactics, air to air. He was a, he was a military and Navy pilot, and he was instrumental along with uh, Thatch, another uh, U.S. Navy, famous U.S. Navy pilot in World War II for, for inventing the tactics that basically how to defeat the Japanese Zero using the, the U.S. Navy's Wildcats and Hellcat fighters. Um, he was shot down during World War II, and of course they named the ship after him, uh, as the Navy does. <laughs> and here we have built it. So this is built basically as it was at the end of World War II. Um, this ship actually served in the U.S. Navy through the early 1970s. Uh, went through many reconfiguration changes, as all these gearing dis class destroyers were. They are very modern for their time, very large destroyers. And uh, um, this, this model represents that in its kind of heyday when they first built it. So it had quite a long career then, even after the war. Oh yeah, like a 30 year career for sure. Um, it went on to, it participated in all sorts of like uh, Mediterranean cruises. Um, you know, several, several like, you know, Cold War crises uh, participated in the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, a part of the blockade of Cuba. Um, so here, you know, we have it basically configured as it was, as it was built. Um, it wasn't painted this color. After the war ended, they painted all the U.S. Navy ships were painted a flat gray, uh, nice, nice uniform finish. They they were probably built in a different camouflage. I think this was a darker, a darker ship when it was first built. So great. So it's a fantastic history there. And then let's dive into the model itself and how this kind of came together for you. Right. This this is uh, this is not my first minifig class, <laughs> the minifig scale destroyer. Uh, it's it's unique in 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 some ways because, uh, as you mentioned, this is my sh my creation at the beginning of the of the of the the video. Actually, technically, it's not. This is the first big build like this that I haven't, you know, kind of greedily held to myself. Okay. Uh, when I first started making these ships, Brick Mania was much smaller, so it was just me building. And now we have multiple builders, lots of talented people here, and we use some of that talent to make a design that more people could come in and put their hands on and use their expertise to, to get started. So as you may notice, uh, the ship itself, it's, it's sitting on this, this gigantic vinyl thing that we printed here. It's, you can come through. Um, but we, we basically, we did this, we tried to figure out a way, like uh, the biggest obstacle for building a ship and getting this, this hull curve just right is actually just that. I, I'd have to eyeball it, do it by hand. So the previous ships, that's how I've done it. On this one, we actually made a a diagram. We took a 3D model of the ship, made a diagram of how we could, you know, how how was the ship made, how was it built, and used this diagram to um, basically, in a sense, mirror or like show the the whole form. Um, let me grab one of the actual Get some of the building material sheets. for it. Yeah, should have should have had this ready. But this this is an example of these are hull sections. These hull sections actually correspond with the stripes. These, these rainbow colors are different layers of plates. So we were actually able to build the ship. Um, each, each builder got a section like this to build, to, to make this hull pattern. And once that hull pattern was built, we built this internal frame to hold everything together. This ship, of course, is meant to move. It's not, it's not gonna be on display in, in Minneapolis here. So it's built to move. These are heavy, heavy duty sections of the ship, but it's built in such a way that you can grab in here it, without any fear of the ship coming apart. I mean, you can grab the top if you want. The bottom will not drop out. It's built to move. It's built into um, four evenly spaced sections. It's exactly how we moved the Nicholas, the USS Nicholas. In fact, we moved it recently to Chicago for an event in our, in our Woodfield store, and we brought it in the Nicholas, USS Nicholas's crates. It's designed specifically that we can make one shipping system that would pretty much take any ship that we built, uh, this being no exception. 
So you've definitely learned over the years and the, the models you've worked on kind of the best way to make it sort of structurally strong and be able to move it around easily. Yeah, I learned the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> so the first time uh, Lando and I drove out to, um, to Brick Fair, Virginia with the USS Nicholas, it didn't survive the trip. It, we, hit, we hit some uh, traffic in Chicago and, and again in Ohio and you know, a couple of abrupt stops caused uh, some major destruction of the ship. Of course, we did get it together on the other end in Virginia, put it together so it could be on display, but uh, we figured we needed transportation system, we need a box, we need somehow a way to get it there, and we just need to build stronger. So every ship that's been built since then um, has been built sturdier. This one, I could stand on it without any, any hesitation. So, um, and that's kind of the test that we've been doing lately. The, the, the Missouri was the first ship that I was confident I could stand on top of it without a breaking. This one, without a doubt, this is even stronger than that one. So, uh, all these sections, I mean, it's, you're, hold it. <laughs> it's sturdy. It it's is, not, it's, yeah. It's no. not, not going to come apart. Like you can move that around without any problem. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, and that's, that's what we're, the aim is. These, this, is, this is actually going to be a permanent fixture of our new Schaumburg store, but until that time, it's got to get there, and uh, it may end up going on the road at some point. Right. If, if the right event happens, we need to do a gathering of all the Brickmania ships, we'll go grab it and, and we'll bring it there. So. And I saw this image on the other side here, so how does this kind of play into the design process as you're looking at that? So when you're, when you're we, we, we basically bought a 3D model of a gearing class destroyer, a scale model, and this is sort of a diagram of, of this is actually kind of an artist's conception of a conceptualization of what a gearing class destroyer is. A lot of it's correct, but a lot of it we've noticed is incorrect. So um, we had to actually, at one point, abandon the, the, the model that we bought. It was great for building the hull, but actually getting all the stuff on the deck. If you, as you pan down, you can notice that there are significant differences, what they show versus reality. Um, so there's a lot of studying pictures, a lot of looking at other, other diagrams that, to figure out exactly where everything was supposed to go. And even then, it's a little foggy. I, I, I did a lot of building and then realized later, oh, this needs to be rebuilt, this needs to be rebuilt. So um, that's kind of the nature of the beast when you're doing something for the first time and it's, you're trying to do a historical representation. You really have to study uh, all the sources that are available um, and then realize which ones are correctly, you know, if it's, if it's, it's annotated to the certain ship, it has to be actually that ship. So. Right, work through the inaccuracies and that sort of thing. Right, process of elimination. <laughs> So what are some of your favorite details kind of on the deck and as we have on top here? Well, uh, this, this the way that this, this ship is. This, it uses these, uh, these are twin five inch gun turrets, same turrets that are actually on the USS Missouri. So that was another thing when we, we split up things on the ship um, that we could duplicate. So these, these five inch turrets, uh, somebody just grabbed one off the Missouri, copied it. The twin bofers here, basically copies of, of, of turrets that we'd made for previous things. The funnel's the same, everything is it's kind of a copy of what we've done before, um, but we're able to mass produce them. So these, these, these uh, quad 40s, you know, the US Navy's very good at making things modular. When something breaks, they can just swap it out for another. Uh, and they famously have done that. They, um, they'll take parts of ships that are, that are leaving uh, a theater of operations and like, oh, we need that turret, and they'll take it off and stick it on another ship. That, that maybe has one damaged. So um, it's the same way for us. We can we can copy the copy the same thing, same sort of details, modularity. Um, there's a lot that still needs to be done. Lots of little things. So next time you see the ship, it, it should be a lot more detailed. I mean, if you look at it now, you could you could easily say it's done. But <laughs> there's always little small things. I'm sure you can add on to it. Yeah, and and, and sort of we've we've gone to the next level um, with the previous ships that we've done. We've done every detail we could possibly find. And this ship being no exception, it's like we, we have to have this up to the same expectations. If you see one of our models in one of our stores, it's going to have to match the same sort of quality that any other model that, that Brickmania has. So you're, you're looking at about 95% complete. And it was like extra 5% of details. They, they matter. It all matters. I yeah. Don't, I don't, I don't want that? somebody to point out some inaccuracy because we forgot to do it or just didn't take the time. And I think it's those little details that really pull people in when they're looking at the model. Yeah. And of course, we have, we'll, we'll put some Easter eggs in here. <laughs> we, we, we built some, uh, we built some uh, uh, like, I guess, stages, some, some places that we can hide things. And uh, they, they will be, they will be in, uh, you know, highlighted later. <laughs> we, we don't want to give it away now. Sure. So. So you've gotten the shipbuilding and kind of design process down to such a science and you seem to have really uh, gotten it down well. So what's your plans for the future here? Where, what's your next kind of big projects? Well, we have a bunch of things on, on deck. Um, so there's stuff that, th this is for us. This is, this is obviously going to be in one of our stores. We can bring it on display. Um, the U.S. Navy is, is, is 
getting us to build a ship for them. So we're building a ship for the um, History and Heritage Command um, this summer. It'll be another destroyer. It won't be, it won't be the same scale as this. Uh, so I'm kind of excited to get, get working on that. Um, as soon as that's done, we're going to be working on an aircraft carrier for us. It's something that we've been talking about for quite a while. Um, we want to do a modern attack carrier because we can have all the modern vehicles since most of what we do has been World War II up to this point. We want to do something a little bit different. Um, so we'll, it'll be like a modern uh, uh, amphibious assault ship, basically. It'll have uh, uh, helicopters and uh, ospreys on the deck. It'll have a, uh, the, her the hovercraft, the LCACs coming out the back. Um, that'll be neat, working elevators and stuff, about the size of the Missouri, uh, much taller. So this ship's about two feet tall. That ship will be about twice as, twice as tall, wow. three times as long, <laughs> three times as wide. So this whole island that you're looking at where we're building this on will be one big aircraft carrier. Uh, and it'll be hard to walk around in here. <laughs> <laughs> that will be an impressive model, so we'll look yeah. forward to that. Yeah, that's hopefully we'll get started on the fall. So. Well, great work. Thank you so much for taking us through the ship here, Dan. Always, yeah. always love seeing your large models you guys yeah. built. Yeah, look forward in our new Schaumburg store. Uh, whenever that's open, that's when this will be appearing in the public or maybe at an event near you. You never know. Well, yeah. thank you. If, there, if, there, if there's submarines that need to be chased away, U-boats, whatever. <laughs> the, It'll you know, make an appearance. Yeah. <laughs>
And since the sea cow in the movie had the paddle wheels on it, so so far this ship will have it too. The front end is to scale from the movie. I actually counted all the bricks and how many, how many bricks down they were, all the angles. So we got that. Okay. We got David Jones over here playing the playing the organ and the Goonies set. You see a lot of minifigures and different sets on board here. Coming towards the back here, we have Spike in his cage. Good spot for Spike to be. And if you want to, you actually could lower Spike all the way down into the bottom of the ball. We got a metal beer up here, a guy in the ship here. And if you look at the yard arms here the, and the rigging here, you can actually pull it and you can actually turn the sails if you need to be. So the first deck, first deck here, we're going to be pointing to, is the captain's quarters. You got a metal beer there when he was young. Over there. And the treasure chest we have Lord of the Rings, Death Star plans, there's the Lost Ark, and David Jones' heart. And the next one here is the armory we have. Over here we have the kitchen. In the back of the ship, this was two scale from the movie. And she had to two um, pictures. I saw two pictures online I found. And so I took it as close as I could to it. I believe I have gotten it to scale. I was watching Rebels and so then so I have Ahsoka and Darth Vader here in the back here dueling. And below them we have Unikitty, in a little set. And just below on the back here we have four half kilo tubes. And then we have the kitchen down here, so we have the cooks down there, and you see Jaja Binks over there. And then we have R2D2 on top there. In Kevin's quarter. And on this here, we got all the cannons firing. And the hardest part of this build was this wheel here. These two wheels, there's no instructions. The Lego movie did not show any structure behind it behind the great pieces here. So I had to figure out how to make it work. I asked everybody on AFL how to do it. He gave some good ideas, but after two years, this is what I came up with. And you see in the center there, right behind the solar panel, right by the solar panels there, I have a skateboarder. And I have many miles there playing volleyball too. Then we have Dorothy here with the Cowardly Lion, Tin Man, and Scarecrow. They look like they're about ready to pop someone. Yes, yeah, the ship across the way over there, everybody's getting ready to go attack that ship. <laughs> and then we have this, we have this little guy down here running from the sea cow. And of all of this, only one, only two pieces are glued together. It's just because of the tension on the, on the rigging here, which is these two pieces right here. I had to glue them. But beyond that, everything's done by clutch power. Oh, wait a second, this turns. And my son thought it'd be funny to put ice cream cone on top of Spider-Man's head. <laughs> Where was Spider-Man? I just lost him. On the stack. Oh, yep. There he is. And we got Pirate Batman on top up here. We got Wallace on the clothes nest. Jim Butte, uh, hard luck guy again. Um, this is the CVN 78 uh, USS Gerald R. Ford. Uh, one of the fun things about hard luck, uh, we get to do lots of different shows throughout the year. Down in Norfolk, there's a there's a shipbuilding event that the museum down there does every year. It's a great show for kids, but the hard luck nerds bring out our boats for those. And the USS Gerald R. Ford is a, is a new uh, familiar site down in Norfolk. They just commissioned her and she's going in and out. So people can recognize her there. So we figured it was time to build one of these. Uh, this is the ship itself is the newest and the first in class of the Ford class. It's different than the old Nimitz carriers. It's got all kinds of crazy new stuff in here that makes it a, a better, more powerful aircraft carrier and lots of fun shapes. Um, so we decided time to build an aircraft carrier. Um, the, uh, the scale, uh, we started out with the air wing. We figured that would be the hardest thing to do. So we built the smallest possible recognizable F-18 
and said, okay, we'll scale up from that. It looks okay, yeah, to the to the willing eye, that looks like an F-18. So I'm sorry. So we uh, we took that and then we scaled up the ship accordingly, and then we kind of lucked out with some of the elements. So like the E-2 Hawkeye almost looks like an E-2 Hawkeye, and the helicopters, the SH-60s, are are yeah. They almost look like helicopters, so you know if, if you come in with a willing eye, yeah, that looks like a helicopter. That's the air wing, and it's about the right scale so that you know little humans can be a three a, a three uh, stud uh, tall little uh, thing made out of tiles. And my son, he's, my son's the scene maker. I do the structure, he makes the scenes. So you could you know put the little green shirts. I'm sure you guys have seen that. You know everybody with a different color shirt has a different job. I guess the the purple guys put fuel on, and the red guys are armaments and stuff like that. So we could, you know, actually build the the deck, and that's what people I think like and look at. They don't look below the deck so much. Um, building the deck itself, we again we built sideways. It's it's almost a mosaic, you know, with these these stupid lines that go back and forth. And I don't know what money these lines mean. I wasn't a carrier guy when I was in the Navy, but you know, we got to put in the different colors for the catapults, and then there's the the landing part and the takeoff part and the. Um, so we again built it sideways and built it out because we at the nose of the carrier there's there's some funny angles that I just couldn't find some studs so I kind of had to, to wing it um, so we built sideways across the carrier uh, the, the deck um, in the bow and in the stern likewise the hull is built out sideways uh, that was to get all those fun convex curves and, and, and things that they've got on a, on a ship uh, midships we could actually brick build it up and then we got clever with some technique to go sideways to, to get the side of the ship midships. Uh, it's got a full-size hangar in there, and I don't know how well, yeah, the lights are hanging out, so you can see in there. Yeah. That's my goofy son again. If you look in the forward hangar, he's got little characters that are in orange flight suits with white helmets and some X-wings and some Y-wings behind <laughs> them there. And in the aft hangar uh, door there, he's got guys dressed up as stormtroopers, and one of them's taller and black for some reason. I guess he's, he's you know, Darth Vader, and, and he's got his TIE fighters. Can't see it very well because of the way we're, we're situated, but in this other side, he's got the old Imperial Japanese Navy, so he's got some zeros in there from last year's build. A little creative liberty with the build. He's a, well, yeah, and somebody's saying, you know, it's a very serious model, but then you look down in the hangar bay, okay, it's not serious anymore, so you're laughing. Um, but again, when you build it this big, you get to have some fun with some of the elements. You know, you can actually put in details like the missile launchers and the radar domes and things like that. Um, so it, uh, yeah, it worked out good when you when you build it out that big and you get these. Um, these, this new island, um, it's a pain in the neck. So in the old the old carrier, they've got a bigger island forward with, with all kinds of rotating radars. This one's got a smaller island with these phased array radars off at goofy angles. And under the hood, there's turntables and ball joints and jumper plates and all all sorts of tricks to try to get those things at the right, the right shape and perspective. So you can look at it and say, oh yeah, that's the Ford. Um, Anyways, uh, that's it in a nutshell. Questions, concerns, or yeah, no, know. that's that's a great a great build. I love how you know how much thought was put into the scale and everything, kind of getting that look exactly right. So when when you bring this to the show, does it travel all as one piece, or how does that work? I, I drive a Prius, so no. <laughs> uh, uh, the the flight deck itself comes apart. Uh, in fact, you can see there's a seam in the middle, so, so there's some okay. you, know, you can see where that's bulging. So again, we had to build out sideways. So the, the flight deck is two halves, and then there, the midships is one big section, and then there's a part for the stern, a part for the bow, and that worked out well because they're, they're built different ways. The, the back end is, again, sideways built. The front end is sideways built, but the middle is, is built up, you know, straight brick built, you know, studs on top. So, yeah, five pieces, actually six if you count the island. It comes off, and you travel with that if you want. Yeah. So... That's about that. And then you won a trophy as well. I want to point that out. So congratulations oh, on that there. Thanks. Yeah, this is, this is a tough room to win a trophy, yeah. and uh, I wasn't expecting it. I, I, I'm proud of the build. I think it's pretty cool. But there's a whole lot of cool builds in this room, as you know. You've, you've talked yes. to a lot of the other guys. So, yeah, it's kind of cool. Definitely. Congratulations on that. It's a fantastic build. So thanks for bringing it out to the show. Appreciate it. Right, thank you. I'm Eric Johnson, and um, basically a year and a half ago, I thought, oh, it would be kind of fun to do a sailing ship. Um, it was the first time I wanted to do something kind of the quality of, you know, BrickCon and, and just see what I could do. And so I found plans online uh, for this ship called HMS Enterprise. It was a frigate from the 18th century. It actually has interiors. You can't get to them anymore, but you can see them online if you want to. There's lots of pictures. So it has all the different decks and cabins and fittings and everything. And, um, yeah, I just built up the hull. The rigging was an interesting challenge. There's no, I mean, the sails are fabric. Um, but there's no metal pieces or rods or anything. It's all... Actually, I found out rigging is surprisingly effective at doing its job and keeping things straight. It, there's a reason they built ships like that for so many exactly, years. Exactly, it works. And I learned an awful lot about what all these ropes do, so that was kind of interesting. So, yeah. 
Yeah, a lot of fun. Uh, then it got a little lonely once I'd finished it, so I made a little smaller ship to go with it. Uh, originally, it's sort of a privateer from the American Civil War, uh, Revolutionary War, because the uh, Enterprise, that was what it did most of the war, was patrolling. I kind of thought, oh, battle, kind of, you know, same old, same old, not very madness oriented. So then I decided to change it into a fire ship. That was one of the events of HMS Enterprise career was when the Spanish fire ships attacked at Gibraltar. So that's what I ended up displaying. Uh, you have the little Spanish crew trying to get away in heavy seas while the British are trying to come over, put out the fire, steer the fire ship away, alert the rest of the fleet, etc. This is just incredible here, and I love specifically the hull. If you can talk about kind of the techniques you use there and how that worked. There are a lot of different great techniques online for doing hulls. I want to do something a little different, so I decided I'm going to try to tile it, but I'm going to try to use the curved tiles and see how sort of rounded I can make it. Those hulls were really rounded, so it's all, it's all um, plates. You know, tried to gradiate to the actual dimensions of the ship's plans as best I could, and then I stuck the curve tiles on top. And um, it's been an interesting learning experience to see what you know what you can and can't do. It's a whole different set of options than some of the other, you know, ways people use hinges and stuff to do the hulls. So, I've enjoyed working with that. And I think you said there's some detail on the inside, but what's kind of the structure like as far as what's holding this together? Yeah. So it's basically um, so at the bottom I did just Technic bricks with plates on top to give it real rigidity at the base, and then it's all you know snotted with plates around the side and then I've got another so then the decks give it a lot of strength so the, you have you know two decks and then they're all connected around the edges as well with you know different different um, you know, bricks that give me the angles I need so it's it's actually surprisingly strong you know if you if you were going to go to the interior which I'd have to take the masts off you pull up the deck plates but there's uh, basically an edge of plates around um, all the way to give it strength um, and you can then pull up one layer to get to the, the second deck and then pull up those those plates to get down to the, the base. Right. And I know you mentioned the, the rigging earlier. What What is the, kind of the main difficulties with that? And what was your technique for getting all those? You know, you've got so many, so many pieces of that string going throughout there. <laughs> yeah, it's just piece by piece. I, I did a lot of studying up what rigging plans were like and what all the different things did. I made a few simplifications, but not too many. Um, there are a lot of people that do some really nice things with dead eyes and stuff that I didn't do. So, you know, it's, you have to sort of pick your battles, which what you decide to do. I didn't want to tile the knots for the rat lines, so those I cheated and I did white glue dots across and then stick the lines across. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, kind of like do f two or four lines a day for a couple of months, I guess. I think they're about 200 lines altogether. And for the, the mini figs on the different boats here, is this anything like custom that you made or pretty much just standard kind of pirate imperial type of mini figs? Yeah, they're mostly pirates. I, I went through and I'm not a mini fig guru. Okay. I picked out a few hats and heads and stuff that appealed to me for different characters, but mostly it's sort of a mix of pirates and uh, a few um, peasants and things from, <laughs> from Castle and whatnot. Right. How would you decide on this water technique? Because I know walking around a convention, you see a lot of different techniques for water. So how would you decide on this one? I wanted to try something different. You see so many where you have sort of a big pool of the tiny um, uh, round tiles, and I thought I'd do something a little different. So, But I still like the roundness to give it some more flow. So I thought, well, what about bigger tiles and see what happens? And I thought I could do some texturing. And I'm you know, pretty pleased with how it came out. It's, it's different, and I, I, I think it definitely captures some motion. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty pleased with it. And when you move this around, is it all just one piece, or how does that work? It is. It's. I, I. I thought about trying to section it, but really, I'm glad I didn't because it never would have worked with the rigging. But so yeah, the water for the big ship, the water piece comes off into four pieces separately, and then I have a board underneath, um, and then I can lift the board, and the whole ship goes with it. It's not actually that heavy, so yeah. Wow. Well, that's incredible. Uh, I love the build, and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about it. Thank you.
name's Darren Reed from Ballarat. Uh, this uh, build here is the um, RMS Carpathia. It's uh, representing the four o'clock arrival of the ship about two hours after the Titanic had sunk, uh, when they started to pick up the uh, lifeboats with the uh, surviving passengers before they returned to New York. The build took about three months roughly of planning, probably about two weeks of building and maybe two days of swearing at it. <laughs> uh, we've got a cat that likes knocking masts down. Um, I tried a few different things that I've not tried before. Um, there's a little bit of brick bending in it, uh, a lot of just standard building techniques and uh, one or two things that I've done in the past with some steampunk shoots where I've got plates and certain parts of the ship actually upside down so that they're just resting on one another so you can use normal parts inverted. Um, on the whole, I, I, I wanted to have a go at it because there'd been a number of Titanic builds over the last couple of years, both here and at other conventions that I've been to, and uh, I just thought it'd be a lot of fun to try and do the Carpathia, which has always been a favourite um, bit of the story of the Titanic thing that I don't think a lot of people really know much about. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of lost in the story of the Titanic. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of uh, older movies where they've shown scenes relating to what was going on on the Carpathia when the actual uh, SOS happened. Um, and I've always found the whole thing, including the, the life of the captain who was in charge of the ship on the, knife, uh, uh, on the night, uh, quite interesting, and I uh, thought I'd have a go at it. And, uh, and surprisingly enough, at this particular event, and I didn't know it at the time, a young eight-year-old has gone and built a Titanic on the opposite side of the uh, floor, <laughs> and there's a bit of a, a running joke that I'm supposed to start pushing this towards them and uh, trying to save him. He's, he, <laughs> it slowly moves across the convention. <laughs> yeah, but I have a distinct feeling I'm not going to get there in time. Um, somebody told me he's already going down um, yeah so yeah. Yeah. so when you started working on this uh, as far as like source material we're we looking at photos of the ship or what kind of stuff did you have to base uh, it off of I had a number of um, historical um, uh, basically a lot of a lot of books that I've got on the on the subject including the the one that I've tended to read the most which was the night to remember um, which I've always been a fan of the original movie from the 1950s, um, which is where I got interested about the Carpathia because it was the first film that they, I think they did on the Titanic um, that I can remember, where they actually had uh, scenes relating to the actual uh, Carpathia and its crew and what was happening. Um, but I, I spent a lot of time looking at um, artwork that people had done of the same time period of the morning, um, showing similar sort of scenes. Um, my biggest problem, of course, with this build was that I didn't have enough uh, Lego to really go and do the base of it. So I decided to go with the material that I've gone and used uh, to give that feel of like wide open spaces. Like most of the artwork shows it in a fairly open area with some icebergs in the background. So I was trying to just recreate that sort of simplistic sort of look to it. It also made it easier for setting up. Um, and, you know, I've, I've talked to a couple of other Titanic fans this weekend. I've had a lot of young kids uh, coming up who actually knew what it they were looking at which was a surprise for once um, and um, and then of course we've got a trying to make sure that there were a right number of lifeboats for the time which I was setting it in because uh, this is about 10 to 4 in the morning so not all the 12 lifeboats or so that were um, supposedly found um, were there at the time so yeah keeping it busy <laughs> yeah. So then for the build itself, take us through maybe some of the details you incorporated there and you know, some of your favorite pieces you were able to use to capture the details. Yeah, well, 90% of the ship is pretty well standard parts, but one of the more unusual things that I wound up and my wife's been having a lot of fun with this is the davits are actually dinosaur tails. Oh, yeah. So she's referring them to them as the dino davits. Uh, most of the liner is pretty well standard parts. I was lucky enough to have a, about a thousand of the little three by um, uh, white lightsaber pieces to be able to do a lot of the smaller detail struts and that. Because I was doing the ship with different techniques that I don't normally do, a lot of the decking is like sideways so that you've got a lot of jumper, um, jumper plates and that holding all the little um, uh, winches and davits all together. Um, and because the ship's been built into several sections and that it made it very easy to actually go and move it about. I've made the mistake in the past of building ships in one part place and not being able to transport them anywhere without breaking tails off or noses. Um, and of course, you know, there were several um, internet purchases that needed to get done in order to complete it because uh, even though my wife and I have a fairly large collection, we've been collecting for about 20 years now, we don't have children, we come and annoy other people's children. Um, 
uh, most of the stuff has come from other um, collections. I did actually go around and nick several of the curved pieces from um, a couple of the modulars. Okay. Yeah, so... Uh, a little parts grabbing here and there. Yeah, I, I've done that on several of my builds. Um, yes, I think uh, Assembly Square is missing a couple of awnings, and uh, and I think the Parisian Cafe is missing something, and uh, I'm sh fairly sure there's something was missing from um, the cinema, from the Palace Cinema. Um, but on, on the whole, I mean, uh, most of the stuff's pretty well. It, I spent a, a lot of time just looking at photos and trying to make a guess because I don't normally build in this scale. Most of the scale ships that I've done in the past have all been brick, um, uh, mini fig scale. So to do one this small, um, trying to represent the crew and that, my wife's referred to them as the little salt and pepper shakers because they, they look like, like the Lego salt and pepper shakers that are about. And um, yeah, I mean, most of it's fairly straightforward. I've used skateboard um, wheels for parts of the um, winches. Um, there's a few chains and things and uh, we nicked name the the name plate we got from one of the um, Lego um, stationery books and that okay, with all yeah. the letters and yeah but but like I said most of the most of the build is pretty well um, standard though we did wind up spending about two hours trying to find one of the uh, brown buckets we got dozens of them you think we could find them <laughs> uh, it's always this is why you organize your collection <laughs> we tried to do that but our, I've been asked about how our collection is organized and I said. Imagine being in the hold of a freighter that's going at the, to the bottom of the sea after being torpedoed. <laughs> the likelihood of you finding anything is zero. Um, yeah. So. yeah. Well, it's a wonderful build here. I think you captured a, a really great part of history with this build, so it's a way to keep it alive and keep people interested in knowing what's going on. So I'm so glad you were able to bring it out to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dan Siskin, and I'm here to talk about the USS Nicholas. It's a Fletcher-class destroyer. Um, built out of Lego, uh, 135th scale. Um, so it's a pretty large scale build. Um, basically do 135th scale because I do mostly do tanks. All of them are 135th okay. scale. Wanted to build a ship to match. Um, so this is a Fletcher class destroyer from World War II. Um, the, actually was the first ship completed of the Fletcher class. Um, beat the actual uh, Fletcher, USS Fletcher, by, by a short <laughs> certain amount of time. Um, so this is, uh, I chose to build this ship because uh, the USS Nicholas was the honor escort of the USS Missouri into Tokyo Bay um, for the signing of the surrender documents ending the war. Um, so this model is about 11 feet long. Um, I'm guessing there's about 150,000 bricks in here. Um, it's traveled around extensively. It doesn't travel well. This was my, this was my warm up build. I was going to build the USS Missouri. Um, and I wanted to experiment. I never built anything this big uh, with this sort of like hull shaping and wanted to see how well it traveled, how, how well the construction was going to work out. Learned a lot of lessons in this ship. Uh, it, it's, it's gone in a couple car accidents or near, near car accidents is, um, and it's had to be rebuilt several times. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a really great chip, and I noticed you got the, the lighting on there, sure. and, you know, are these uh, minifigs uh, custom that you made yourself? They are, but you can't tell. They're, they're wearing, they're wearing uh, life jackets, yeah, but they are, they are custom printed okay. figures. Here, I can pull, pull sure. one apart here. Um, so, if I can get them off the ship. <laughs> here, I'll take one of these guys. So, you know, kind of have the luxury at Brick Mania when we, we want to get our own guys printed, we actually get a local pad printer to do it, but... So these are custom printed U.S. Navy sailors, so U.S. Navy dungarees. This is actually our first generation. We have a newer version of it out now. Um, but we do, we do sailors. We do them for the Navy. We do them for museums. Okay. So, so these, are, these are our own, our own product, actually. Yeah. Um, Very nice. Of course, of course, brick arms, helmets. The, the, the vest is a Lego, standard Lego piece. Um, so everything on here, except for the helmets, is, is official Lego. The lights are not, though. They're from brick stuff. So I have to mention them because they, they graciously gave us the lights to, to, to light the ship up and program the Morse code and the signal lamp for us. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and those lights make it you know, really just that much neater you know, when you see those sure, lights. Sure, sure. We have lights. We have a whole bunch more lights we're going to add to this. So all the other things that you see on here will all light up just, uh, eventually. You know, there's there's always a back. I have I have more more ambition to build than I have time. So uh, one of these days I'll get this thing back into into the workshop and and re-rig it to put the rest of the lights on. Okay. 
What's the inside of this like as far as kind of the upper areas? Uh, is there a lot of just support pieces in there? You didn't build any of like the actual rooms or anything like no, that? No, yeah, there's, it's, it's just kind of built on a frame. Okay. I, I, I learned my lesson, built, built this one. It's a, it's a Technic frame, basically the same way like a, like a snake or something works. It has a central spine, central keel, and then ribs that come around. Um, I learned the hard way that's not a good way. It may, maybe works in steel, but it doesn't work in Lego that well. <laughs> so... Yeah, and this comes. It looks like there's there's what about four or five sections this yep. comes apart into. This, this this is this is built in four sections. I I've learned the hard way. You have to build to uh, doors and vehicles. You, if you can't if you can't fit it through a door, probably shouldn't build it. Yeah. And if you can't fit it in a vehicle, you can't take it with you somewhere. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. got to make sure you can take it around and display it shows and things. Yep. So this one's I think there's four sections of about three feet each. Okay. And is the what's the the toughest part of putting together a ship like this for you? Is there you know little details that you like to put on, or what? How's that work for you? Well, this one the toughest part is to get that deck to slope. So you have bricks going in multiple directions. So the deck is sloping. It's you know the, the hull is curved, curved, and it's starting you know just just from traveling. It's 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 separating. So making it structurally sound and keeping all the the right shapes that's the hardest part. Mm -hmm. um, the de the little details are the fun parts they're to the me. Fun those are those are fun. <laughs> they're easy, and I usually don't get to do that until after the the main components are done. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's really neat. Thanks for taking us through that. Oh, you're welcome. My name's Nathan. I uh, built this uh, USS Constitution in Lego here. Uh, if y'all seen it before, uh, it's the second time I've shown it. Um, essentially, last time it was just the boat. Uh, this go around, kind of a uh, new stand, new. Uh, backdrop to it uh some motion to make it move um a lot more detail in the in the rigging itself um when you pull the strings in the rigging you see how the sails will go up and down all of them are tied in that way so as you go through each one they'll work and then back last time i had them tied just to make the yard arms move the uh, boat mechanism to make it rock was pretty simple. Uh, I'll pull it up here in just a minute. I just got a simple little camshaft lobes hooked to a worm gear box and little motor, so nothing too fancy. And then uh, tiles and stuff create a cradle for the boat so it doesn't push it too far away. And, Aside from that, nothing too hard. Even though it's not crazy complicated, it creates a great kind of rocking motion that gives a nice extra level of detail. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, nothing against a boat just sitting there, but a boat just sitting there is just sitting there. So, you know, this way you got something a little nicer to look at, people to run and try to catch it thinking it's going to fall over, stuff like that. So, <laughs> you know, a little more fun to watch. But... Uh, what do you have running through the, the whole top of the, the ship here? Okay, so what that is, I took and uh, cut out nautical flags out of different strips of colored uh, sticker to make uh, USS, it says Lego USS Constitution America BF-19. There's a little legend in the book here. Uh, the, the boat's listed in the history category. So I went ahead and built some uh, plaques that kind of talk about the battle record and the... Uh, specs from the boat itself how long it is crew uh served on it that kind of stuff the book is actually a compilation of a lot of letters and artwork from each engagement that the boat's been in so there's letters from the captain and letters from somebody else on the boat so you get a perspective from both views but uh now we got a little history report with the uh lego contest there and uh, other than that, that's about, uh, that's about what's new with it. Um, what about the, the larger scene you kind of added around it? Okay, I did that uh, mainly, um, again, a boat just sitting there, sitting there, and without something to stand, you're kind of just on a table. So being able to put a little backdrop to it, and not take away from the model so much, but, uh, you know, give it something more to look at than just the tables, my idea behind that. Also, I made the lighthouse work. If you look inside, it's got a motor spinning the lighthouse. And once again, just to add a little more movement to the display than just sitting, nothing going on. 
Uh, what was the process like adding the rigging to the sails? Because, you know, as you showed, all of that stuff actually works. So did you have to experiment a lot with that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, nothing ever works the first time. I think the only thing that worked was the uh, rocking mechanism. Aside from that, you get halfway through the rigging, find that this one won't go over that one the right way, so you tear them all out. But uh, essentially, two to about two years worth of tying knots in order to get the sail rigging done, and another year and a half worth to get the hard lines done. So a little, little close to three and a half, four years worth of work on the boat itself. Uh, not over one time, but you know, over time. Um, As you were working on it, did you have a chance to visit the actual ship? No, I haven't been on the actual ship yet, but the website for the museum is really informative. Anybody who wants more information or see what's in my book, all that information is available at the website uh, for the USS Constitution. So. so was it kind of photos and that sort of thing then that you were working off of? Absolutely, yeah. Photos, rigging maps, things like that, so I could get as close to the boat as I could. And Some things aren't perfect, but uh, it was because scale of the Lego itself versus what I was working with. But and how to make them automated instead of having them one here and one there. It's in a loop. So it uh, worked out pretty good. Again, like I said, nothing ever worked the first time, though. You get it halfway done. This one's tangling with that. There's a lot of lines that are tied in between to separate strings. So uh, I think I calculate close to 300 yards of string in the running hardware, another 150 yards in the black string, and then uh, well, it's about 2,500 different hand-tied knots. So. That is impressive. That's a lot of effort into this build, but it really makes it, uh, you know, very realistic looking here. And so I think it, it adds a lot of detail to it. So this is obviously kind of a very iconic ship from American history. Do you have plans to do other ships in this similar style? If I show the boat again, I'm thinking I would show it attack, you know, like aftermath of what the ship did to something else, you know. So I have some of the English ships that it went in and try to do something a little more historic and there's two boats sitting there, here we are, they're on fire, we're not, that side of stuff. But, uh, um, you know, I mean, the history's been astounding. When I started building the boat, I learned about the rigging of it, and, you know, once I started digging into the history, it got so interesting that, you know, it was hard to put down what I was reading because it was so fun to learn about it. And uh, I said, it's a really, really interesting history. It's still in the active in the Navy today. Uh, still manned by naval sir, uh, soldiers. It's the only ship in the Navy that uh, has ever been fired on and is still in active duty. Uh, so, you know, there's, it's from 1700s on to today, and it still floats is amazing in its own right, you know. Yeah. But It really is an incredible piece of naval history here, and I think you captured it really well, so I'm glad you could bring this out to Brick Fiesta and keep updating it and making it more impressive. Thank you so much. Thank you all for showing up. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it. Hi, I'm Julie Vandermeulen. Um, so I built HMCS Haida, a 10-foot-long tribal-class destroyer. Uh, so this model... Um, I guess the whole thing started back in 2008. Um, I, this is actually a museum ship in my hometown, and I got a job there for the summer. So way back then, I really wanted to build this model. Um, it was completely unfeasible in terms of parts and size, and I didn't know how to do stuff so well. So I built a whole series of ships until I finally had enough parts and I knew enough how to build ships to get to doing this large one. <laughs> Okay. Very nice. So you want to point out a few of the details on the ship, you know, the main sections and things for us? Yeah, so um, one of the cool details is the torpedo tubes. Um, it all swings out. These are roughly accurate to scale. It's all minifig scale. And then I have the, uh, the boffin guns um, and the various other weaponry. Uh, the, the funnels I really need. They're, um, it was a case of finding exactly the right slope to, to get that angle. Um, yeah, they're, it's really, really, really complicated. I got really lucky on a lugable quarter getting the right parts a few years earlier. <laughs> yeah, um, and there's the little tiny boat here, the motor cutter. Um, that was probably about a two-hour build. I just roughly, quick, quickly roughed it out. Um, I've done this, this uh, slope with tiles for the bow a lot of times now. So it was just second nature almost to do that. Um, the most difficult part to build is the mast here because it is open lattice i don't get to hide anything like i do with everything else uh and there's no there's no good angles either it's all weird not 90 degrees which is makes it really difficult yeah 
And so all the details here, like you can see in the bridge, it's all different parts. Those are all as accurate as possible to the real thing. Uh, so there would be a compass and the, <laughs> the thing they use to tell the engine room what the speed is. Um, yeah, so it, it's all extremely detailed because I have access to the real ship, so I took pictures of everything. Um, and yeah, it's designed for minifigs, although I haven't added very many. Um, so in terms of, it's really big, so people will ask, how do you transport it? Well, it comes in sections, so here's one oh. section, and you see the inside is all made of Duplo. Yeah. Get some good structure going with the Duplo. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it saves me a lot of parts and it makes it much more rigid. Um, and then I have... The only non-LEGO parts in here are the LEDs inside. Okay. Some nice lighting going on in there then. When you start on a build of this size, you know, this is a pretty massive building, 10 feet you said, uh, where do you start as far as like planning? Do you like sketch it out or what do you do for that stage? So first thing is I found a lot of drawings of th this class of ship online. Unfortunately, there is two different types. One's 10 feet shorter, so I didn't realize that until I had already <laughs> found these drawings and then had to restart. Um, but yeah, so I got lots of pictures. I visited the ship. Um, and then once I got my drawings, I s first start with rough out the bow and the stern in brick and then design the rest of the hull in LED. Um, because it's really, really fragile to try and just do this in parts. So then once I've got the LED, LDD of just the hull, I put that together, fill in the interior structure, do the top side, and then add all the details on top. No other drawing or other planning than that. Very nice. And I noticed here that you uh, won the award for, nominated at least, for Best Mega Creation. So congratulations on that. Thank you. <laughs> Very cool. And thanks for taking us through the build. Appreciate it. David Tapia, this is the Green Mermaid. My daughter named it. <laughs> uh, we actually didn't have a mermaid on it until just the other day. But it does come apart. It's fully modular. We got in here, we got the captain's cabin. Doing a little bit of navigation, making sure they're going in the right direction. Down here we have the officer's area. A little guy napping. That was a last minute build, so it's not perfect. <laughs> um, got a dog chasing the cat around. I love the tiled floors in there, though. That's that nice kind of fancy detail to it. Yeah, that was a last-minute throw-in. I had extra tiles. Wanted to do that. Um, this pops out here. We've got some storage area. Little locked-up chain gate. Make sure nobody steals anything. Keep them honest. The galley and mess area. Making some fish stew. Yesterday was pickled pork. <laughs> These sections here do pop off. So you can see the cannons underneath. And under here, under the boat cover, there's one of those little rowboats. Yeah. And all the sails are custom, and based off of Lego templates. Also for the hammocks, those are based off of one from the Friends line. Yeah, that's incredible. So much detail in there. So is this uh, design based off of any particular real ships or just kind of something you came up with in your head? No, just kind of cause something I came up with in my head. I always wanted a ship as a kid. And then now that I'm an adult, I want to build it so that my kids can play with it. There's access for the minifigures everywhere in there. Um, and I like how it comes apart. It's fairly sturdy. There are just little bits and pieces that need to be tacked back on every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Talk about kind of the design process with this, because obviously a ship has a lot of interesting angles that uh, is, isn't always easy to achieve with LEGO, so how did that come together for you? Um, I knew I wanted to do a double-decker that came apart. Uh, I started off with like one hull piece shorter. Uh, originally, there were guns on the bottom and on the top. Figured that wouldn't really work with the waterline and everything, so I moved them up to the top. Um, it took, overall, it took about a year for the whole design process. Um, but this most recent rebuild was about eight hours spread over three days, so a lot of work in there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. What would you say is the, the hardest part of achieving this design for you? Um, I would, like you said, the angled areas up here in the front. We got the Lego hull piece, getting that to work with double layers. I'm still not happy with it, but it's a work in progress anyways. <laughs> and then back here for the curved hull pieces or sorry, the curved areas. Uh, just getting the angles right with these bricks here um, and making sure everything fits. 
Some of it is illegal, some of it's legal. It works. <laughs> yeah, it all fits together in yeah. the end. <laughs> well, that's so impressive. So do you plan to expand on maybe a larger fleet in the future or more ships? Oh, it, this is the one that I brought with me. There are more at home okay. in boxes and stuff. But, yeah, we'll probably expand a little bit more. Yeah. There you go. Well, thank you so much for taking us through the whole build here. There's so much fun details to look at, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for coming out. I wanted to make the largest battleship ever made, which was the battleship Yamato. And once I made it, I, was, I did more research. What happened to it? Well, it was on a one-way mission before the war ended. And this destroyer, this Japanese destroyer, was with this battleship during that engagement. And then planes from the carrier helped sink the battleship. So that's what I wanted to capture and wrap everything around. So now you see the planes dropping their torpedoes, attacking the carrier. And what, what I love about, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm just talking the battleship. What I love about the battleship is, again, the flag, because it's a larger flag. So I was able to show more of a wave in that um, image of the flag that it looked like it was, like, flowing in the wind. And then, again, the bow wave, uh, these big ships would punch their way through the water, so I wanted to capture that moment, too. Unlike a destroyer, which is much lighter and faster, these types of ships would slice their way through the water. So I wanted to see, I wanted to show that image as well as for the bow wave to uh, slice through the water. And plus, all the guns and all the um, the turrets on this, they're all uh, able to rotate or go up and down because I wanted to show a lot of movement. But of course, you have to move those on your own. There's a lot of planning that goes involved, especially when you have to separate you know, something this large. When you the planning stages. Or if you separate the ship, you got to make sure that you're not going to separate it in the middle of an island because that would be catastrophic as far as like uh, st uh, stability. So there was a lot of planning in the beginning stages. Where am I going to separate this? And also, when you're making something that's going to require electricity, you have to make sure that you have a hole in the bottom of the ship so that the uh, power cord can come through. And we can, I can show you that when we get to the other side. So I wanted to show uh, when you're planning for a ship this size and you want power to go through the, the throughout the entire ship, in the very beginning stages, you have to make an entry point into the ship so that that wire can go inside. So that's like the very like beginning stages where you're going to put the hole in the ship for the power, where you're going to separate it so because you don't want to separate the ship in the middle of an island. So you can see separation right there and there's separation right there. And then here's a really good example on the ship that I'm building right now where the the entry point for the power has already been designed. The, uh, it's already been separated so that you'll know where the island's going to go. And that's uh, something that uh, is like done in the very beginning stages. And then over here, I want to show the... Uh, there's a lot of movement that you can do for the guns. So we have the gun turrets that can turn. They can go up and down. And every gun can do this. It's something that I wanted to make sure that I was able to represent all this articulation throughout the ship.